you may be seated. Welcome everyone to the funeral services for Hannah Katarina Davidson. I, Bishop Davidson, will be conducting. As I thought about it, I thought she was always there for every time I needed to be somewhere else, and she would be very disappointed in me if I wasn't here doing this right now. And so, uh, President Davidson uh, presides, and we're grateful to have also uh, President Tiger and President Clark with us as well. Y por los que están escuchando desde Perú, le damos la bienvenida y mandamos nuestro amor por ustedes también. And thank you to everyone else that's uh, watching or viewing uh, by way of our electronic transmissions. So, we would thank uh, Esther Davison for the being the chorister, uh, Holly Wardell for the, uh, the organist, and then the, some, some of the prayer read by Rachel Beck and Julie Beck. We'll go ahead and open today with the opening hymn, number 293, Each Life That Touches Ours, Ours for Good, after which the invocation will be given by Melody Beck. And then we'll have the life sketch by Emma Smith and John Beck. Uh, then uh, speaker Joe Beck. And then we'll have a musical selection, Peace in Christ. And then uh, Dennis Beck, Carol Spencer, and Will Beck uh, will speak to us. And then I'll give some remarks. And then after that, we'll have a few remarks by President Davidson in the closing hymn, number 152, Copy with you till we meet again. And then Madison Davidson will give the benediction.
my dear kind Heavenly Father, we are so grateful today to come and ponder and reflect on the gift that Hannah was in each of our lives. We are so grateful that we associated with Hannah as a daughter, a sibling, a wife, a mother, and a friend. We are so grateful for her joyful spirit and humor and how she touched our lives. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for thy plan of salvation and for our understanding around the atonement of Jesus Christ, how he can help us all to endure and to return to him as one family unit. Heavenly Father, at this time we ask for blessings. We ask for blessings on all those who mourn, that we may also mourn with them, that we may lighten each other's burdens, that we may be kind, that we may have a true remembrance of thy loving spirit. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We'd like to introduce ourselves. My name is John Beck. My name is Emma Smith. We are some of the founding charter members of the Hannah Davidson Fan Club. We wanted to tell you a little bit about our organization. We were established in the summer of 1991. We have grown exponentially over the years. We have members in virtually every state and members across the globe. Uh, most recently, we established a chapter in Peru, and we give them a warm welcome today. Bienvenido. Now for the reason we are here, uh, we need to talk and we need to celebrate the life of Hannah Davidson. Hannah Davidson was born in Great Bend, Texas on July 16th, 1991. Like most things that came out of Texas, Hannah was born with a big personality. She was the sixth and final child of Dennis and Carol Spencer. Even though Hannah was the youngest, she saw herself as an equal with everyone in the family at a young age. Hannah lived in Flowerman, Texas for a few years, would stop New York for a short season, and eventually settled in Littleton, Colorado. Hannah earned a nickname very early on that stuck with her for most of her life. Um, her mother, uh, Carol, was very active in a bowling league, which in the future, bowling would be a shared passion with Hannah. Hannah was dropped off at the daycare service provided by uh, the bowling league, and when the daycare employee asked her what her name was, she mumbled the name Hannah. The daycare employee misheard her and wrote hammer on the name tag. <laughs> That's how she got the name, but if you didn't know Hannah early on, we're gonna share with you uh, how that name stuck with her. Hannah was active and loved to play with her siblings. As a young girl, she would jump on the, the back of her siblings' legs during family prayer. I don't know if you've ever had it happen to you, but it hurts a ton. <laughs> One time, she received stitches from jumping on the bed. She was creative and a lot of fun to be around. This is a trait that has been true with Hannah for her entire life. In July of 1999, Hannah was baptized by her brother, Will. Uh, this was something that was very special for, to her, and it was a, a shared bond that, that made them very close. Hannah attended Leeward Elementary School. She was active in student government. In fifth grade, after a very intense campaign, Hannah was elected vice president of the student body. After a major scandal and resignation, Hannah took the reins as president. She ruled with love and compassion. In elementary school, Hannah was also involved in music programs. Hannah was very gifted with her music ability. She played Bob Cratchit during the Christmas Carol. Uh, Hannah loved spending her days um, her summer days at the Normandy pool with her mother and siblings. She learned to swim at an early age and enjoyed it throughout her childhood. 
One of our favorite swimming memories was at a pool where there was a couple publicly displaying their affection. Gross, right? <laughs> Hannah came up with the idea of a game. Who could splash them the most with cannonballs? I jumped first, and I splashed them pretty good. Emma jumped second, and they had to have been getting the message. Hannah, never wanting to be outdone, jumped in. Darn near landed on the guy. <laughs> I don't remember them hanging in the pool much longer. Uh, mission accomplished. <laughs> if you thought Hannah was as fun as a child, Hannah exploded with personality as a teenager. Big sunglasses, pop music, and bright colored shoes were a staple in our household. Hannah thrived off her interactions with people. She loved music, she loved to dance, and she loved joking around with friends. The local stakes in the area would host monthly dances. They were a lot of fun. One of the rules of the dances was you had to be 14 years old to attend. Dances, music, and friends were a combo that just couldn't be missed by 13-year-old Hannah. Determined to attend a dance any way possible, Hannah started powering through all the requirements for her Young Women's Recognition Award. She then started to to plan her capstone service project, which was a spiritual thought followed by a dance. As the organizer of the dance, Hannah had to procure treats, make assignments, find a DJ, and most importantly, as a dance planner, she needed to attend the dance to verify others were having a good time. She went around to all the different dance circles, uh, danced with people uh, uh, to ensure they were having fun. And that's how Hannah attended her first dance. That's also, and a little more importantly, uh, how Hannah completed her Young Women's Recognition Award at the age of 13. Hannah explored new sports. When she tried out for the lacrosse team, she played, mo she played most of her time. Oh. Hannah explored a new sport when she tried out for the lacrosse team. She played most of her time in high school. She par participated in powder puff football, the name on the back of her jersey was Hammer Time. <laughs> Hannah continued to foster her musical ability. Her freshman year, she was in the musical, Susical the Musical, as a citizen of Whoville. She frequently sang with her father, accompanied by her stepmother on the piano during sacrament meetings in her local ward. She also sang the national anthem a couple times for school events. Hannah was extremely proud of her participate participation in show choir at Columbine High School called Blues. Hannah's first car was a dark green Saturn. You guys have probably seen it racing around town. It now belongs to her mother-in-law, Anne. When Hannah was, when Hannah learned she could have her own car, it was under the condition of her being able to learn manual transmission. She put all of her energy into learning how to drive stick shift. She mastered it in a couple of hours. Hannah was highly motivated and determined individual. If there was something she wanted, she could pick it up fast. Uh, when Hannah was 13 years old, her half-sister Rachel was born. Rachel idolized Hannah. As a three-year-old, she would put on Hannah's high heels uh, and walk around the house pretending to be Hannah. Rachel was obsessed with princesses, and Hannah was the, the best princess we knew. Hannah was warm and friendly to everyone she met. Hannah was four years younger than John, but she was a great at becoming friends with his friends. This was especially true in high school, and especially true with girls I had crushes on. I was never embarrassed about it either, because Hannah was so funny and such a joy to be around. Uh, Hannah would work hard at becoming friends uh, with Ross's sisters, Diana and Janet, and also their friends. Uh, she chaperoned a New Year's party and made, them, made pizzas for everybody. She organized a bunch of games. Uh, she visited with her friends and saw, and saw that as opportunities to make new friends. Her welcoming spirit paid off. She has developed special relationships with each of her sister-in-laws. Hannah was a lot of fun in college. She attended her first semester at BYU-Idaho in the winter of 2010. The frigid winter was not enough to slow her down. Hannah met the love of her life her first semester. <laughs> when a gr group of cute boys knocked on their door asking if they would join 
Their intramural basketball team, Hannah didn't, he didn't hesitate to join, not for her love of basketball, but for the cute boys on her doorstep. <laughs> not knowing she was about to meet the love of her life, Hannah, <clears throat> Hannah impressed Ross by blocking one of his shots while they were practicing, even though Ma Ross might try and deny that fact. It's okay, Ross, I would be embarrassed too. <laughs> I really appreciated the humor that Ross and Hannah had together. And, and one story that really highlights it is uh, early on in their relationship, uh, Ross was walking back from uh, class and, and Hannah was walking to class and, and uh, they were on the opposite sides of the road and uh, Ross tried to wave Hannah down. Uh, she didn't see him. Uh, she tried to shout out to her and she couldn't hear him. She had her headphones in. And uh, so Ross, looking around, uh, picked up some snow and packed a nice snowball. He lobbed it up over the street and hit Hannah on the back of the neck. <laughs> so little did Ross know that Hannah was talking to her mother about how sweet of a boy that she just started dating. <laughs> <clears throat> we were all a little nervous since she was 18 when she first met Ross, but we made sure to do our research. By lucky coincidence, one of our dad's employees was from Burlington. He gave an excellent review of Ross. Also, John's girlfriend and now wife was in Hannah's ward. She was there to give us the inside scoop of their relationship. We only heard good things about Ross. We knew it was serious at John's wedding when Ross joined the family photos. That was before they were even engaged. We were a little hesitant, but Ross was committed and knew he wanted to be a part of the family. It was a bold move, and we respect that. When Hannah first told our dad about Ross, she said, Dad, this guy reminds me a lot of you. She sure knew how to win my dad's heart. Ross continued to uh, win our hearts by promising uh, our dad that Hannah would still graduate from college, uh, even though they got married at a young age. Ross kept that promise, and we will always love um, him for all the support and encouragement he gave Hannah. When it came time to <clears throat> for Hannah to visit, visit Burlington, there was a special welcoming committee awaiting her with water balloons, and she was teased heavily to make sure she would fit into the family. Hannah passed the test. Even with the warm welcome, Hannah came home with a love for Burlington and all the people there. I remember when she came back and said, I could see myself living there for the rest of my life. Hannah was quick to forgive her welcoming committee and developed a great love and friendship with them. While dating, uh, Ross learned some important things about Hannah, like how important birthdays were to her. Uh, that summer, Ross returned home to work, and Hannah stayed in Rexburg and uh, took a full semester of classes. Hannah's birthday fell on a weekend, and she hoped Ross would come up to visit. Ross was not able to make it, and Hannah was devastated. We threw her a big party to cheer her up. We called it Hannah Palooza. It included bridge jumping, swimming, and we finished it off by roasting hot dogs at Saint, the St. Anthony Sand Dunes. Even with all the fun activities, I could tell Hannah missed Ross the entire time. Ross probably got an earful about it. The, the other day, he told us he learned the lesson, Hannah loves birthdays, never miss her birthday. On her final birthday, uh, before she passed away, her children were able to come from Burlington and spend some of her final moments with them. She was able to see her newborn baby, Elsie. On the night Ross proposed to Hannah, Ross knew that she was going to search the car for the ring box. So ha Ross hid a fake ring box in the console of his Explorer. That night, Ross took Hannah to get her favorite meal, meal chicken strips at Dairy Queen. <laughs> More to come, about, come later about H Hannah and her love of chicken strips. Ross forgot his wallet, so Hannah had to pay for dinner. <laughs> Following dinner, Ross blindfolded Hannah and took her on a drive. He warned her it might be a long drive, so he gave her a box of cereal for a snack. Inside the cereal box was a Starburst bag, and inside the Starburst bag was the real ring. Ross was going to take Hannah to a special spot at a park. When he arrived, there was already a car there, so Ross drove around some more until the car moved. 
When Ross got there, he took Hannah's blindfold off and asked her to open the cereal box and the Starburst bag, which had the ring inside. Ross got down on one knee and started his spiel. Hannah started to cry. In a joking way, Ross stood up and said, are you done yet? (laughs) Hannah stopped crying and Ross continued his remarks. Hannah later confessed that she had snooped and found and saw the fake ring box in the console. Hannah and Ross were married and sealed for time and all eternity on November 27, 2010 in the Denver, Colorado temple. It was a special event in part because Ross's dad had been undergoing uh, treatment for cancer in Denver and he was able to attend the wedding. The wedding was in true Hannah fashion, bright colors, lots of candy, her wedding, dress, uh, her wedding colors were blue and pink. She had a candy bar loaded with all her favorite candies. Hannah's favorite sister returned home from her mission in June 2012. <laughs> uh, John and Hannah came home to hear my homecoming talk. Afterwards, they invited me to return to Idaho with them. It didn't take much convincing because Hannah and John were always so much fun to be around. I ran home and packed my bags to go to Idaho. While there, we would have FHEs together and even had a Nerf gun fight in Ross and Hannah's apartment clubhouse. Hannah and Ross even let me come on their ward rafting trip. Moving to Rexburg to be closer to and spend more time with Hannah was one of the greatest decisions I ever made. I will cherish these memories for the rest of my life. Hannah and Ross have always been generous. They've always opened their home to others, and they never judge those going through difficult circumstances. They just loved them and made them feel at home. Every time I went over there, there was always someone doing laundry at their house for free. Um, They would frequently invite people over for dinner. Hannah followed Christ's example of service. Well, at BYU, Idaho, Hannah and Ross took a bowling class together. During their last semester, they would bowl 10 to 12 times a week. That semester, they won the intramural bowling championship. As we mentioned earlier, Hannah loved dances well in Laramie. Uh, She continued to serve by chaperoning dances. On multiple occasions, young men would approach Hannah and ask her to dance, not seeing the ring on her finger. Hannah became quite the chef, but it wasn't until, but it wasn't that way at first. When she first met Ross's family, Ross's father, Mark, asked Hannah what her favorite food was. She thought about it for a second, and she told them it was chicken fingers and macaroni and cheese. I believe Todd's response was, those are my favorite foods too, when I was in fourth grade. As time went on, Hannah learned to cook beyond frozen chicken strips and Velveeta mac and cheese. She got pretty good at meatloaf, cinnamon rolls, and as a special treat for those she cared about, she would make them their favorite meals on their birthday. She picked up the name Head Chef. Her meatloaf was very famous. It also led her to pick up a new nickname from Todd, Meatloaf. And I heard that was a special request every time he came home to visit. The community of Burlington meant a lot to Hannah. Hannah was a huge Burlington Husky fan. She loved to attend Husky sports game with her friend Tyler. Where are you, Tyler? Oh, he's okay. And um, I just wanted to thank Tyler for being such a, a good friend to Hannah. Uh, she often talked about, about him and he, she loved uh, your visits. And thank you for being such a good friend to Hannah. One of my favorite attributes about Hannah is how important family relationships were to her. As we've gathered together as a family and shared stories about Hannah, a common story was how Hannah sent all her nieces and nephews birthday cards. She would sew scripture bags and send them copies of the Bible and Book of Mormon. She would call family members Um, She would call family members when they were having a difficult time to cheer them up. When Diana and Janet were serving a mission, she would email them every Sunday. Her heart was so big, 
and she had great priorities. Uh, last no November, Hannah and Ross had the opportunity to go to Peru. Peru was a very special place because that's where Ross served his full-time mission. Hannah loved meeting the people there. She would listen intently, nodding her head. After a few minutes of conversation, they realized she didn't know a word of Spanish. <laughs> Hannah still cared about them and loved seeing and getting to know the people Ross served. Hannah had a strong desire to become a mother. She knew it would be her most important calling in life. Many of you may not know this, but Hannah struggled getting pregnant for a couple of years. After much fasting and prayer, and with medical counsel, Madison Mabel joined the family. Hannah found a lot of joy in raising Madison. Madison radiates. <laughs> Madison radiates many of the same attributes we love about Hannah. Hannah was well-rounded with the skills uh, she was trying to develop in her skills, or in her children. She set goals for them and taught them meaningful life principles. Her primary goal was to provide them with the knowledge and confidence uh, needed to have <clears throat> happy and joyful life. Hannah had four children. Uh, Madison Mabel was born May 6, 2013. Um, when we look at Madison, we see uh, the caring nature of Hannah's heart. Mark was born on July 25th, 2016. And Mark, when we see you, we see a lot of laughter and we see all the humor that your mother had. Hiram was born October 23rd, 2018. And when we see Mark, or when we see Hiram, uh, we see Hannah's love of sports and her competitive nature. And Elsie was born July 13th, uh, 2020. And when we see Elsie, we see Hannah's undying love for her children. Hannah's life was full of service and caring for others. She was a true disciple of Christ. Her greatest calling she, she had here on earth was that of mother. She loves Madison, Mark, and Hiram, and baby Elsie with all of her heart. The last week of her life was special because she gave birth to a, ba a beautiful baby girl and on her final birthday, she got to see her kids for one last time. I love my sister dearly. And I know this is not the end. That because of Jesus Christ's atonement, I will get to see her again. I believe that to be true. That we will be able to see Hannah one day. And it will be a glorious moment. And that... Christ truly raised, was raised from the dead, and we will be as well, and that we will be all together. And I say the same, Jesus Christ, amen. Hannah is one of my best friends. <laughs> There's just something so special about her that makes all of us feel that way about her. She can light up a room whenever she is in it. She is always center stage. We are all drawn to her because of who she is. Over the last week, I've been trying to think about what makes Hammer so special. First, Hannah has a very special sense of humor. <laughs> Her smile is infectious, and it brings peace and happiness to everyone who is lucky enough to see it. She can find something to smile and laugh about, even in the most tragic of circumstances. When Hannah was life flighted to Salt Lake City, I personally was devastated, and nothing could bring me any, any, any joy that day. The next day, though, she posted on Facebook wishing Ross a happy Father's Day and was joking about how she gave him a private jet ride for his Father's Day. That Monday, it looked like she was doing a lot better. She was off the ventilator, and I spent the entire day at work texting her. I told her about my weekend and some of the things that happened in my life, and I joked with her that mine was almost as eventful as hers, and she responded with a typical Hannah selfie. She had an oxygen tube in her nose and was making a goofy smile, basically saying, oh yeah, tell me about how eventful your weekend was. 
Not even cancer could stop Hammer from being who she was. <laughs> this past Sunday, as I woke up, I was thinking about her, and I remembered something that David Bednar once said. He said, perhaps the greatest indicator of character is the capacity to recognize and appropriately respond to other people who are experiencing the very challenge or adversity that is most immediately or and forcefully pressing upon us. Character is revealed, for example, in the power to discern the suffering of other people when we ourselves are suffering, in the ability to detect the hunger of others when we are hungry, and in the power to reach out and extend compassion for the spiritual agony, agony of others when we are in the midst of our own spiritual distress. Thus, character is demonstrated by looking and reaching outward when the natural and instinctive response is to be self-absorbed and turned inward. So as I was thinking about that, I realized that that paragraph might be one of the best descriptions of Hannah. She loves harder and cares more for people than anyone else, even when she is confronted with challenges of her own. After receiving her cancer diagnosis, but before she was life taken to Salt Lake, she was looking into making cancer hats for other chemo patients. She said, service might be the only way I make it through this. I have been on the receiving end of her love and service more often than I really wanted to. Last year, I was going through a really hard time. I flew back to Colorado to spend some time with my parents, and Hannah had just given birth to Hiram a few months before. She packed him and Mark up in the car and drove down to meet me and to take care of me. She stayed with me and talked to me whenever I needed it. As I returned to California, and she returned to Wyoming, she found new ways to serve and comfort me, even though we were hundreds of miles apart. Over the next several months, she answered the phone every time I called, and she would talk to me until I felt better. She sent me and my daughter packages that always brought smiles to our faces, even on some of the darkest days. What amazes me about Hannah is that she treated everyone like this. We all have stories of the love and service that she gave us. She is kind and considerate and thoughtful in everything she does, and I treasure the, treasure the memories of her love and kindness. The world would be a better place if we were all a little more like Hannah. The day after Hannah passed, I was looking at old text messages between me and her. And as I was scrolling, I found one from a while ago and she, that, she, that she had sent to me a long time ago, but it felt like she was sending it to me then. It said, I love you, Joe. Keep strong, my friend. You can do this. I sat there and cried and felt comforted by her. Even from the beyond the grave, Hannah was reaching out and sharing her love. Death, even death, cannot hold Hammer back. Nothing can stop her. She will continue to provide us with joy and laughter and love. She will continue to be one of our best friends, and she will continue to be a light and example to all of us. Hannah, we love you. We miss you. I eagerly await the day when I see you again. I'm certain that there's going to be a loving embrace. You're going to crack some dumb joke. <laughs> And we're going to laugh and love as if no time had passed until that day. Thank you all.
I just want to preface our talk by Hannah would be really pleased that her dad and I are standing next to each other, mourning together, letting bygones be bygones and our shared love for our daughter. Hannah Katarina Beck Davidson taught me so many things, and I won't tell you all of them. She was my personal assistant from the time that she could, she just kept track of me. Having six kids, she reminded me of appointments. I don't know how she remembered them because I didn't. But um, I want to read a line or two, or a paragraph or two from one of her friends wrote. The f her name is Katie. The first time I met Hannah, my mom and I went over to meet the new family, the Becks, who had just moved into our ward around the corner. I was about four, and we were so excited to have a big family with lots of kids move in. Honestly, the only thing I remember about that visit was seeing Hannah, who must have been about three, come into the room and start calling her mom Carol. I remember thinking, that's a little different. She calls her name mom by her first name. But I think that just describes Hannah. She did things her own way and made a mark anywhere she, want, she went. The first thing I, I want to tell you about Hannah is she taught me to be yourself. Be the person that you are. Another thing that exemplifies Hannah that I learned from her comes from this scripture. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Those two commandments Hannah lived. She, she was very loving to her friends, her family, to strangers. She was a kind person. And I'm seeing her naming all these qualities, and when I was listing them, I was thinking of the chapter in Preach My Gospel where it talks about the characteristics of Christ. She is obedient. She was forgiving. She magnif magnified her calling, most importantly, wife of Ross, mother of Madison, Mark, Hiram, and Elsie. And she also magnified her church callings very well. The one thing that I thought of was, and I couldn't find the scripture because I don't, my memory on scriptures, I just remember what they say, not what, where they are, but was about the atonement. The atonement is, uh, helps us and the Savior, we repent from our sins and, and we are able to be forgiven for those. He also it talks about um, how he knows to, how to succor his children because he experienced all our pains, all our sufferings, all our illnesses. As I mourn the loss of my youngest daughter, I am proud of the woman that she became and is. I want to read one scripture that, uh, another scripture that uh, reminded me of Hannah. See, I was sitting up here taking pictures of, of the thing. <laughs> it says in uh, 2 Nephi 31, 20, you must press forward with a steadfastness, steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall feast, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ, and endure to the end, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. I'm not worried about my daughter. I am worried about her family, who will miss her deeply. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
During the last week of Hannah's earthly life, she was, it was a tremendous time of pain, anxiety, and uncertainty. We had the blessing of being able to spend several days and nights with her in the intensive care unit. There were many priesthood blessings, much hand-holding, and other efforts to render comfort. But the one thing I remember the most was being able to sing hymns for her. They gave her peace, and she particularly loved the youth songs and the primary hymns. In the early hours, the first night after she passed, I woke up and I was similarly comforted by the, one of the primary songs I had sung to her so recently. It's called Give Said the Little Stream. As I pondered the words, I thought about Hannah and her life and realized that this was a real tender mercy from God. Give, said the little stream. Give, oh give, give, oh give. Give, said the little stream, as it hurried down the hill. I'm small, I know, but wherever I go, the fields grow greener still. That verse describes this precious daughter of God so very well. Wherever she went, the grass was greener and the light of life was brighter. The other touching part of this first verse was, as I hurried down this hill, it's perhaps even more comforting to think about that. And Hannah hurriedly completed her life down the hill just one day after her 29th birthday. As I look back on her life, that was a common pattern, as you've learned from, from the, the family. She was the youngest of six children, but she stepped into the family with a strong presence, and she spent her life on a determined path. She put her head down and completed her young women's recognition by the time she was 13. She was married at 19 and enjoyed nearly 10 years of marriage with Ross, during which time she brought forth four beautiful children, accomplishing all of this before the ripe old age of 30. And speaking of Ross, it was challenging for me to know that this nice guy from Wyoming was interested in my 18-year-old daughter. Thanks to a reassuring reference from Ryan, as John had mentioned, I was really comfortable and confident that Ross would be a great husband. I remember sharing with her, however, that she would be in a different role now. As you've learned, Hannah really, particularly when she was young, had a real sense of fashion. And uh, when she was starting to get serious with Ross, I asked her if she'd be ready to give up having all those different colored pairs of Converse shoes to support her, their ambitious educational goals, along with all the challenges of raising a new family. She gave me a very sincere, undeniable yes that she was ready. As I think back on that moment, a scripture has come to mind from 1 Corinthians. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, or in Hannah's case, a woman, I put away childish things. And Hannah certainly did. When we learned that Hannah was ill, a tremendous effort went away to get her the best medical care that could be offered anywhere. Multiple aggressive treatment therapies did not make a difference. The cancer progressed more than ever should have been possible based on all the medical knowledge and experience that is currently available. It's been one of the most difficult things for us to realize that it was time. Time for Hannah to hurry down the hill and return to her father in heaven. I know that he has a plan for her on the other side. As for Ross and the other children and the children, I can testify to all of you that life works. They will do well and they will be blessed here on earth. And many of you will be the instruments that will be rendering blessings in their lives. They will live together as an eternal family. And Hannah is already a busy angel supporting them from above. As the song goes, the fields will grow greener still. Now we are all here. We're mourning the life of Hannah Katarina Davidson. Elder, now President Russell M. Nelson has shared the following. Death separates the spirit and the body, which are the soul of man. That separation evokes pangs of sorrow and shock among those left behind. The hurt is real, only its intensity varies. Some doors are heavier than others. The sense of tragedy may be related to age. Generally, the younger the victim, the greater of the grief. Mourning is one of the deepest expressions of pure love, Elder Nelson continues. It is a natural response in complete accord with divine commandment. Thou shalt live together in love insomuch that thou shalt weep for the loss of them that die. That's from Doctrine and Covenants, 
section 42. Moreover, he continues, we can't fully appreciate joyful reunions later without tearful separations now. The only way to take sorrow out of death is to take love out of life. And we have loved her life, have we not? We have loved it so much. So what do we do now? How do we handle this morning spirit we have with us? I go back to our song because it reminds me of what Hannah would do. Give then as Jesus gives. Give, oh give. Give, oh give. Give then as Jesus gives. There is something all can give. Do as the streams and blossoms do for God and others live. And the Book of Mormon says it well. Carol shared this scripture with us, but I'd like to share it again. Let us all press forward now with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if you shall press forward, feasting upon the words of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. And from the Gospel of John, our Savior stated, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. I know that Hannah would want us to serve others. She did it so well. She would want us not to be ashamed of Christ and to openly share his gospel with others. As for me, I will continue to focus on this and do all I can to ensure that I will be with her again someday. I would also like to take a moment to express my gratitude to all the good people of Burlington for all the love and care you have shown to our daughter. We are so grateful for you. We know that Jesus lives, that he is our savior, and that we will have a joyous reunion again someday. I share this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Sorry, guys. I just wanted to touch on a few things that Hannah would want all of you to know. Hannah's death is incredibly sad for us. But in many ways, it's joyful. We have a purpose, a reason that we came here to earth. Adam fell that men might be and men are that they might have joy. Before we came to this earth, it was part of God's plan for us to come here and to get a body. Our bodies are special and important. And the other reason that we came to this earth was to learn, to learn about God, to try to become better as people, but ultimately to become more like our Heavenly Father. And it's through the difficult experiences that we have on this earth that we learn the most. Just going through this experience with Hannah and feeling the pain of loss that we all feel. I feel a great ability to be able to be there for other people in their loss, to see when they're struggling. I uh, wanted to share a scripture that testifies what God's most important work is, and that's in Moses 139. He says, For behold, this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. The most important thing to God is that we can have eternal life with him and become like him. When Adam fell, he partook of the fruit, and Eve partook of the fruit, and it made it so they could now feel pain. They could feel sadness, but because of that sadness and pain, they also were able to understand true joy and true happiness, and we cannot have the one without the other. And at that time, leaving the Garden of Eden, 
death entered into the world and it entered into the plan. There were two deaths, the physical death that would come, but also the spiritual death. And spiritual death is being separated from God, being separated from Jesus Christ. In Alma chapter 42, verse 6, it says, Behold, it was appointed unto man to die. Therefore, as they were cut off from the tree of life, they should be cut off from the face of the earth. And man became lost forever. Yea, they became fallen man. And now you see by, that, by this that our first parents were cut off, both temporally and spiritually, from the presence of the Lord. And in verse 15, And now the plan of mercy cannot be brought about, except an atonement should be made. Therefore God himself atoneth for the sins of the world, to bring about the plans of mercy, to appease the demands of justice, that God might be a perfect, just God, and a merciful God also. And mercy claimeth the penitent, and mercy cometh because of the atonement, and the atonement bringeth to pass the resurrection of the dead, and the resurrection of dead, the dead bringeth back men into the presence of God. And so there was a fall, and that required someone to have a redemption for us. And Jesus Christ did that. He suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went there with his friends. And he left them for a moment and he went and prayed. And he asked God to remove that cup from him. And he asked him three times because of the great pain that he was in. He wanted to see if there was any other way. But that was the only way for him to take all of our sins, all of our pains upon him. And he felt those. And that pain was so great that it caused him to sweat great drops of blood from every pore. And shortly thereafter, he went to the cross. And he was mocked. He was ridiculed. And again, he felt every pain that we'll ever feel. He knows exactly what it's like to lose Hannah. But that's how he can comfort us. That's how he gives us strength. He knew exactly what Hannah would feel in her battle with cancer. And when she hurt, and when she was panicked, he was there with her to comfort her and let her feel his love. And he was buried in the tomb. And three days later, he rose from that tomb. That was the greatest miracle that has ever been done in the history of the world. Death conquers us all. It's part of the plan for everybody. But he rose again. In Alma 22:14, he breaketh the bands of death, that the grave shall have no victory, and that the sting of death should be swallowed up in the hopes of glory. The grave hath no victory. It's taken Hannah, but she will live again. And there is a still some sting to death, it feels like to me. I still feel this horrible sadness. But that sadness is swallowed up, like it says, in the hopes of glory. The hopes of being able to see Hannah again in a resurrected, perfect, beautiful body. And being able to see her with her family and her kids again. In uh, Doctrine and Covenants, Section 130, verse 2, it says that the same sociality which exists among us here will exist among us there, only it will be coupled with eternal glory, which we do not now enjoy. What that scripture means to me is that because Hannah made the right choices and she was married in the temple and she committed to Ross for all eternity, that their family will be an eternal family. And we believe that they'll be able to live together for, forever in happiness and joy. And... Uh, I want to testify to you that I know that's true. I know that even though we're all going through such a painful and terrible time, that we will all rise again, and that we'll all be able to uh, live together with our Heavenly Father. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So a lot of times when you get a bad diagnosis like cancer, they have people make a bucket list. And as I, they were talking about the swimming pool as a kid, it reminded me of one of Hannah's uh, favorite things of, about buckets, is McDonald's used to do a bucket of fries. And Hannah always told me about this bucket of fries. 
And one time I thought, you know, I'm going to do something for my sweetheart that, that would really mean a lot to her. So I went into McDonald's and I asked them, I said, can you take the extra large drink cup and just fill it with fries for me? And they would not do that. So that one is still on our bucket list. But uh, yeah, it, it definitely made me smile. And speaking of food, I guess, uh, we do want to invite uh, those that would like to to uh, join us after the uh, burial to come back here for a meal. Uh, there should be plenty of food, so we'd love to see you and visit with you a little bit. So uh, I just prepared a few remarks. Uh, I'm Hannah's bishop. She would like to tell people sometimes if I made a, a joke that was maybe a little bit uh, too Ross-like and not enough uh, <laughs> bishop-like, she would say, did you hear my, what my bishop just said about me? <laughs> and so this is a little bit of a mix. This is uh, from Hannah's bishop, uh, from Hannah's Ross, but also from her best friend. So. My sweet Hannah, oh how we miss you. I have never seen or felt such an outpouring of love as we have continued forward these last couple of months. Thank you everyone, we love you so much. My Hannah had the faith to be healed. She also had the faith to accept God's will. Hannah marked this quote three days before she took me on that private jet vacation for Father's Day. This is from Elder Quentin L. Cook. Peace comes from knowing that the Savior knows who we are and knows that we have faith in him, love him and his commandments, even and especially amid life's devastating trials and tragedies. As I was going through her phone and her, uh, some of the things she'd marked and uh, written, that was one of the first ones that came up. Then a few lines later, Hannah wrote, Christ suffered all. He is greater than I am. He gave his life. My moment is small in comparison to his. I can be more like him, end quote. We love seeing and especially feeling the power of prayers for Hannah and our family. There is such a power in praying to our loving Heavenly Father. To, to see people praying or sending uh, kind thoughts from, uh, like they mentioned, most of the states and from all over the world, uh, that, that meant a lot to us throughout uh, the, the trial, and we really have felt your love. Uh, I want to take a moment and share a few little treasures of some of the miracles that we saw. I think we all desired uh, the grand miracle of healing. We know that those miracles do happen. That was the miracle that we sought. But uh, that one, uh, now we are hoping for the miracle of the resurrection. We know that will happen. But there were plenty of miracles along the way. I won't mention all of them, uh, but I did want to share a few of them with you. Uh, I just listed out five. The first one, Hannah's ability to stay positive even in the midst of such a trial. That kind of hope and optimism can only become, come because of her knowledge of God and his goodness. Hannah liked to describe that... Uh, when I like to paint uh, pretty pictures as far as the situation, and uh, you know, I think sometimes as we would talk about it with people, they'd say, wow, you guys are really optimistic and with all you're going through. And Hannah would say, yeah, Ross is really good at that. It's, it's kind of annoying sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and so to continue with that annoying optimism, uh, our little baby Elsie came on her own. We were surprised to meet her that July 13th, and I didn't know we could cram so many people into one hospital room. Uh, the third one, since Elsie and Hannah were in different ICUs, uh, the healthcare team arranged for Hannah and I to go down and see our baby Elsie the next day after she was born. What a tender, sweet visit. Hannah put her all into being a mom. And then th the fourth one we've heard a little bit, but I think it's worth repeating because it did mean a lot to Hannah. Hannah loved her birthday. <laughs> I won't give a full account of what happened when I missed her birthday in 2010 when we were engaged, but I will just say that I understood a lot better that her birthday was special. I wanted to surprise my beautiful Hannah with a nice birthday present. She hadn't seen the kids in person in almost a month. With the help of lots of kind souls at the hospital, I received approval for the kids to come and see Hannah for a little bit of time the afternoon of her birthday. What an amazing birthday party. She was gluten free, so we never had a good cake anyways. So, uh, What a miracle to get those kids in that ICU during these difficult times. It truly was a miracle. I think Heavenly Father heard two kids named Mark and Madison plotting to send themselves in a package loaded with fruit snacks to the University of Utah Hospital so they could visit her. <laughs> After seeing Hannah uh, give her three oldest kids hugs and kisses on her birthday, I knew that her birthday was complete. It had been a miraculous birthday. God is in the details. He knew what ha needed to happen for Hannah to see her three oldest angels and her baby Elsie. She died early the next morning. And then Hannah wrote this in her journal. On June 17th, she had the question, what are you willing to sacrifice in order to become a more faithful disciple? She wrote, I am willing to sacrifice all that I have to be a faithful disciple. 
That is my calling in life. That is such an important thing for me to be an example of the Lord Jesus Christ. I take a lot of pride in this. I want to be a disciple of Christ and help others come closer to him. I think that brings the ultimate joy in life. I am grateful that I have been given the opportunity to know my Savior, Jesus Christ. I am grateful that I have the opportunity to teach other people about his life and mission on earth. What joy and change the gospel brings, it is so beautiful. And with what joy and change the gospel brings, that is exclamation point. Uh, end quote. Madison, Mark, Hiram, and Elsie, I promise you that your mom's spirit is close by. I know that she will be resurrected, as will all of us. Our family can be together in the presence of God if we continue faithful to those things we know to be true. Thank you, Hannah, for all that you did, for your faith, example, and light. Please, everyone listening today, write down what you felt today and follow the impressions you receive. God will guide your path and you can feel his love. Jesus Christ made all of this possible. The Holy Ghost truly comforts. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen to everything that has been said today. Thank you, everyone that loves Hannah and Ross and their family. Thank you for continuing to do so. Often, the words of the gospel are not adequate in describing our feelings. I appreciated Bishop Davidson's thought about writing down the feelings that you have, because when the Holy Ghost is combined with the words that we say and the songs that we sing, we have a more complete language of the gospel. Words aren't adequate to describe events such as these when our souls stand still, when the busyness of life fades away, and we consider what is important. We consider the relationships that we have, the love that we have, the family that we have. Words are not adequate in describing the loss that has occurred. But it is also true that our words are not adequate to describe the hope that wells within us as we contemplate a loving Savior. As already spoken about by Will and also by Alma in chapter 7, verse 7, he tells us that there is one thing more important than they all, one event that transcends all. And then he went on to describe the birth, life, and atonement of Jesus Christ. In that same chapter, as he, as Alma went on, and as Will spoke of earlier, he described the Savior being able to feel the sickness, the pains, the afflictions. The Savior knows what it's like to be a seven-year-old girl who has lost her mother. He needed to know that so that he can help, so that he can heal, so that he can strengthen. He knows what it's like to be a young father, a bishop, caring for both a family and a ward. who wasn't ready to hold his sweetheart's hand for the last time. The Savior knows these things because the gospel and his atonement are very personal. They work on an individual basis. He knows how to hold Ross 
to strengthen Ross, to heal him. That is true of all of us. I encourage all of us to let that hope well within us, to let our faith in a loving Jesus Christ take us forward. One last thought of the Savior and in the Gospels, in the New Testament, in the concluding chapters of both Matthew and Luke, it describes observing the Passover, breaking and blessing the bread and the water, going to the Garden of Gethsemane, of a soul that was in anguish and heavy Once again, he gives us an example of at that moment when he perhaps wanted to turn back but pushed forward with Heavenly Father's will. It says in Luke chapter 22 that he prayed more earnestly. And then he moved forward. The Savior is real. The events described are real. The power, his power, manifest in the atonement and in sacred covenants is real. I am witness to his workings in the lives of many people and I testify that he lives. May I just close with words from Katharina von Slegel. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. With patience bear thy cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul. Thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to joyful end. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful for the people who are sick can feel better. And please bless our family and friends. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.